Okay guys, welcome to uh, the next video in bonding and structure. So we've already looked at three different types of bonding. We've looked at ionic bonding, we've looked at covalent bonding, and we've looked at metallic bonding. We're now, for the purposes of the GCSE, have got to be able to explain the structures of these substances and the properties that are caused by these structures. So you know how to draw your dot cross diagrams, etc. But now we've got to look at how these ionic compounds, covalent substances, and metallic substances actually behave when they join together. So in this part of the video we're going to look primarily at ionic compounds. Okay, and then we look at the other two later on, the covalent and the metallic. Okay, so first of all what do I mean whenever I talk about the structure? Well, we've already looked at sodium chloride and if we talk about the formula of sodium chloride you would know to go to the periodic table and find sodium um, and to find chlorine and they both have a combining power of 1 so the formula of sodium chloride is NaCl. Now a lot of students therefore imagine that sodium chloride exists as these two little atoms joined together one being sodium and one being chlorine or chloride. Well, really, that's very far from the truth. What this actually tells us is the ratio of sodium ions to chloride ions in a structure of sodium chloride. And really all that it's telling us is that they will be found in a one-to-one -one ratio. They do not exist as these little sodium chloride molecules floating around like so. So the question is then, well how do they exist? Well they exist in a structure called a giant ionic lattice. Now the first thing we need to work out is what does a giant ionic lattice actually look like and how can we use the fact that something is a giant ionic lattice <coughs> to explain its properties. And when I talk about properties, okay, what I'm talking about are its melting and boiling points. Okay, I'm talking about its hardness. Okay, is it brittle? Is it soft? Okay. Talking about it being malleable, so can it be bent into shape? Is it ductile? Can it be drawn out into long, thin wires? Does it conduct? Okay, conduct, that could be either heat or electricity. So those are, are pretty much um, the properties that we're going to look at. So we'll have a, f a look at first what a giant ionic lattice actually looks like. Okay, so if we have a look at the screen now, you'll see a diagrammatical representation of a giant ionic lattice. And the one that I have chosen here is indeed sodium chloride. So if we have a look at it, we can see that instead of having our nice little sodiums and chlorides, joined together in a little molecule is this network of large chloride ions and smaller sodium ions very very um, in a very organized arrangement now this is the lattice this is only a very 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 tiny subset of a lattice a lattice goes on for millions and millions and millions of these ions and this is a repeating structure within that lattice Now, so if you can just imagine these things very, very close together, very, very tiny little particles, but going on for millions and millions and millions of these units, repeating and repeating and repeating. <coughs> so how does that then affect the properties? Well, first of all, giant ionic lattices have got extremely high melting points. Okay, MPT, just short for melting point. Now why is that? Well the reason for them having this very high melting point, I'll just move that to one side for a little second, okay, 
is because they have extremely strong bonds. Okay, in order to melt something, in order to melt this, I've got to break bonds. I've got to start breaking bonds. To melt it, remember your kinetic theory back in key stage 3, you have to have particles which are free to move. So in other words, if I melt this thing, I can have particles which are free to move, but that requires huge amounts of energy. So why does it have a high melting point? Well, that is because of extremely strong attractions and that is, this is really what I'm writing out here is an exam type answer and that is between oppositely charged ions Okay, so that's why that's got such a high melting point. And if we take, for example, sodium chloride versus magnesium oxide, both ionic substances, this one has got the highest melting point. Now, why is that? Well, it's because sodium is plus one, chloride is minus one, magnesium is plus two, oxide is minus two. And hopefully, you'll be able to work out that a plus two and negative two have a greater attraction than a plus one and a minus one. The other thing is, sodium and chloride are much bigger than magnesium and oxide. And if they're smaller and they're more highly charged, they will attract each other more strongly. So that is the reason why all ionic substances, as far as we're concerned, have very high melting points. And it's the reason why some of them have higher melting points than others. Lots of these, magnesium oxide for example, can be used to line the inside of furnaces because it has such a very high uh, thermal stability. Okay, it's difficult to, to break down. Okay, so let's have a look at <coughs> another uh, very important uh, aspect of the. So we're going to look at this time conductivity. We're going to look at in this case we need to be aware of electrical conductivity. Well in order for something to conduct electrically it has to be able to carry charge and essentially it has to be able to carry electrons which are E negative charges. Okay, little particles with a negative one charge. Now, can these substances carry charge? Well, if they are solid, as they are at the minute, with all the bonds in place, they can't. In order for these substances to carry charge, we've got to again break the bonds. And when we break the bonds, the sodium ions and the chloride ions are free to move. And when they're free to move, in that point, they can carry charge. So we'll have a look at why they can carry charge whenever the ions are free. So, essentially, for electricity to flow from point A from point A to point B we've got to have something which allows the flow or the carrying of electrons from point A to point B <coughs> well if this substance is a solid there's nothing that can carry the electrons because everything in here is in a fixed position they cannot move well let's have a look then if we take the substance and we break the bonds. So there's two ways we can break the bonds. If we took some sodium chloride table salt and we put it into water, you'll know that it will dissolve. And it dissolves because at that point the bonds have been broken. So the sodium ions and the chloride ions are free to move. The other thing we can do is we can just melt it. Okay, we can just melt it up to a really high temperature and that will break the attractions between the positives and the negatives throughout the structure. And if I break those, then the bonds are broken. And that means I have got my ions free to move. So, if we take a typical cell, okay, this piece of apparatus might look a bit strange to you, but hopefully it will become fairly clear in a few seconds. So this is my positive terminal on my cell. This is my negative terminal on my cell. And in here we'll say we have sodium chloride. 
Now my negative terminal is negative because it's covered in electrons. Okay? There's an excess, there's a build up, whatever you want. This part of the cell is pumping them out and they build up on this electrode. This part, this electrode here is positive because it's removing electrons so therefore this cell is electron deficient. It is short of electrons. Okay, so in order for this substance to conduct electricity I need to get electrons to move from there to there. And if I put a little bulb in them Okay, here, that bulb will light if electrons can move from there to there. Right, well how on earth am I going to get that to do? Because I'm sitting with it in solid sodium chloride. Well, let's heat this really intensely. Okay. And we'll see what happens. Well, if I heat it really intensely, the bonds between the sodium and the chloride break. And that means in here I'm now going to have many, many millions of sodium ions and chloride ions separated from each other. Okay, so let's just tidy this up a little bit. Okay, now my sodium ion is positive and would be attracted to here. Okay, to my negative terminal. And when it gets there it has the ability to actually take an electron off the electrode. Okay, so it will gain an electron and it will just turn into uncharged sodium metal. Na plus, plus an A minus, so a plus and a minus together. No charge and I get sodium metal. Over here then, my chloride is negative. So it has got a spare electron on it. Okay, it will give its electron up. Okay, so minus E minus, and that goes to just a chlorine atom. This is a slightly simplified version of this. Okay, for the per just to aid your understanding. So don't worry if you read about it in textbooks, and it's slightly different. So essentially, what have we done? Well, here we have taken an electron off. Here we have put an electron on. So essentially, we are taking electrons off here we are putting them over there. That means that we have now completed the circuit and electrons are able to be taken, pumped out by the cell this way, go to here, taken off here, put on there. And that means that we have therefore got a completed cell. Okay, now, and that is why these ionic substances have the ability to conduct electricity when they are in two states, when they are molten or they are aqueous. Molten means just melted, heated up and melted. Aqueous means dissolved in water. Hopefully most of you know that. And the key thing is, why can they do it in both those states? Well, that's because you've got free ions. And free ions can, as we just saw, they can carry charge. In other words, those electrons, remember I said the electrons were carried from one electrode to the other. And that meant that the circuit was complete and the bulb could light. So that is why these things can carry charge when molten and aqueous. They cannot do it when they are solid because the ions are not free to move. Okay, The ions are in fixed positions is what you would tell an examiner. Okay, Okay. so finally guys what we're going to look at just is solubility of these ionic substances in water. So if we have a look at first of all um, a water molecule. So water is H2O and if I was to just draw it out like that what you want what I need you to understand here is that water has got little charged ends and the little charged ends in water have got the hydrogens as delta positives and the oxygens as delta negatives. Now delta 
as far as we're concerned just means a little bit. So they're a little bit positive and a little bit negative. Now remember in ionic substances it was made of ions. <coughs> okay, It was made of positives. In this case we just looked at sodium chloride. Positive sodiums and negative chlorines. So how does this affect the solubility of these substances? Well, when you put them into water the positive and negative ions that you have are attracted to either the sodium in this instance would be attracted to the positive or negative water, uh, oxygen of the water, sorry, and the chloride would be attracted to the delta positive, the hydrogen part of the water. Now what happens then? Well, simply what happens is that the substance will dissolve. Okay, and if we look at the diagram that we have here, for example, what simply happens is we just zoom in on it a little bit hopefully you'll be able to see it fine okay as you can hopefully see that the positive sodium ion is now surrounded by water molecules the big dark blobs or circles or the slightly negative or delta negative oxygens and the others are the hydrogen so the key thing is that the sodium ion is now on its own it is separate from the chloride. And what's the significance of that? Well, the significance of that is basically is that these bonds that were in here have now broken. If we look at the chloride down here, the chloride is surrounded by the hydrogen, the delta positive hydrogen atoms. Okay? And again, the key thing is that the sodium and the chloride that we have here are now separate from each other. And what does that mean? Well, as I said earlier, that means that the bonds in the structure have broken. And therefore, ionic substances tend to be soluble.